Again, at the Touching Hearts Ministries Church, we want to welcome you today. If you've been viewing our programs, give us a call, email us, or, or text us. We'd love to hear from you. And pray that you've been encouraged, uh, not only encouraged, but that maybe that you've been educated on some of the different subjects that are in the Bible. You know, the Holy Spirit, Crystal, has a way of taking very difficult subjects and making them so simple. And that's what the Spirit does. And so I'm going to pray today that the Spirit will be with me as I bring this message. We know the Spirit's been here. Jan, we've already felt the Spirit today uh, in our, our teaching class that we had with CJ that was turned out really well. And then in the music and the piano and the guitar and Brother Mike leading out, we've really felt the power of the Holy Spirit. But I, I just feel reassured, Rosemary, that I can pray and say, Lord, be with me and give me the right words to speak. Because uh, there may be somebody on the other side of that camera that are this close to accepting Jesus Christ. And let him change their life forever. So I'm just going to kneel right here. And those that can in the sanctuary. <clears throat> we invite you to do so. And those on the other side of the camera. If you're able. Lovely Jesus. We thank you so much for this day. That you have allowed us to come together as a church. Uh, we ask that your spirit continue to remain with us today. Uh, give me the words to speak. And may they come smoothly. And with power that comes from the throne today. Uh, we're going to talk about our friends that are behind that invisible curtain, the angels that you send on a daily basis to help us in our needs. Thank you, Father, again, for the privilege of preaching Jesus Christ, not just my creator, but my best friend. Amen. So if you're turning your Bibles with me, those in our church today and, and those on the other side of the camera, and again, I always invite you to write these scriptures down and maybe study these scriptures for yourself. Um, sometimes I get with Linda and I give her the scriptures that we're going to be doing and, and I've got a bad habit of switching all over the place, jumping here and there. So she probably has a hard time keeping up with me. But we're going to turn to Hebrews, the first chapter, verses 14. Let's do that. And here's what the Bible says. Paul says in speaking of the holy angels, listen, are they not ministering spirits sent forth from God and His Son, Jesus Christ, to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Who are the heirs? We are. The Bible says here, our brother Paul speaking in Hebrews, that God knows that we are going to have trials. And even though I've had trials and I've had victory through Christ, unbeknownst to me, on the other side of this invisible curtain that's up there's an angel there with me my guardian angel and sometimes God will send even more angels to support you and strengthen you and encourage you in your endeavors to destroy our arch enemy the devil but let me read this to you today's message is about angels who are they why were they created are they truly involved in everyday life of human beings are they programmed as one with a robot, or do they actually possess emotions, feelings, wisdom, and intellect? And they have all of those. And we're going to find out through what the Bible says, not what I think, how I feel, Susie. We're going to find out today what the Bible says about that. Now listen to this. There are, listen carefully, we will discover not all angels are beneficial. Not all angels are for mankind. We will find today, as we study the Bible, that there are two classes of angels. One class will live forever, and the other will not. We're going to find out today that there are a set of angels that are our enemies. But praise God, only one angel of God is more powerful than all the angels that the devil can throw at you today. Just one angel today. Now, listen to this. Here's what the Bible says. Read this with me, and you'll find this in Revelation. And there was war in heaven. Now, we probably heard this scripture over and over again. I want to read this one more time. There was war in heaven, and Michael, who's Michael? It's Michael. Jesus. Michael. And his angels fought against the dragon. Who's the dragon? You know, these are simple questions for us, but there are those folks today on the other side of the camera that have never sat down and actually studied the book of Revelation. Listen to this. 
and the dragon, which is the devil, and the dragon fought, a, and listen, and his angels, and they prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out of heaven into the earth, and his angels were cast with him. So today, I'm not only in a war with the devil. I'm in a war with an innumerable amount of evil angels today. Is anybody with me? Well, you all sound discouraged already. Well, don't get discouraged. Let me finish. Let me read this to you. Quickly, or as quickly as I can, I have a hard time getting anything done quickly. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail of the angels that are evil first. Let's, we're going to dispose of them quickly today. We're going to talk about the evil angels. And they are unholy and they are disobedient. For I want to share with you the angels who love, who have chosen to serve us. To serve us. They are on our side. God's angels today are on Donnie's side. Sometimes I have a pity party. I'm all by myself. But the angels are on my side from God. They are unseen. We are separated by an unseen curtain. They are, the Bible says, our fellow servants, and the angels of God are my friends. Wow. <laughs> Come on. I, didn't, I heard two amens out of that whole bunch there. Listen to this. Then shall he say, Jesus said unto them that are on the left, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and the angels. Come to find out, Hell itself is prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? Because they sin first. <laughs> they sin first. Let me read this to you. Angels that follow Satan at the second coming. Now, this is going to be, I wasn't going to get into this subject, but you know what? It just fell in my lap. And I have to. But I won't, I won't stay on it for very long. Listen to this. Angels that follow the devil. That were cast out of heaven. At the second coming, when Jesus comes, do they continue to live forever? They're not immortal. A sinner that doesn't accept Jesus Christ is not promised immortality. Those that accept Jesus at the second coming will be transformed into a body that will last forever and ever. Is anybody with me? Aunt Ruby will have a brand new body. Colton will have a brand new body. And this body is designed to last forever and ever. And only those that have been washed in the blood of Christ and filled with His Spirit, only those have immortal life. Now, I'm going to, uh, this is a subject, I know it's, it's touchy. The fire that the Bible speaks of, everlasting, is everlasting in its effects. And we're going to find out what I'm talking about in just a minute. Now listen very carefully. We will discover today, and I'll read it to you Jen, that the holy angels of God, those that chose to stand with Jesus in the battle against Lucifer, these angels communicate between God and mankind. They will live forever and ever and ever with the redeemed. Who are the redeemed? Us. <laughs> Those that have accepted Christ. And Mike, you brought it up this week. I'm so glad you did. Those that have accepted Christ, washed in their blood, wrapped in Christ's righteousness, and continue to live for Jesus, those will be in the kingdom. Those that accepted Jesus Christ 47 years ago, and the next day backslid, they will not be in the kingdom unless they repent. They're not going to be there. Now we'll get on that in just a minute as well. But listen to this. Here's what the Bible says. Not down in shelf. It makes it crystal clear in Revelation 12, 7, 8, and 9. And here's what we read. We said that there was a war in heaven. And that Satan had influenced a third of the angels. How many was that? It could have been multi-trillions. I don't know. Heaven's a big place. He influenced a third to go with him and go in war against Jesus and his angels. And I can tell you that, that was pure foolishness. Did they have spears and arrows? No. I think there was a great debate. A great debate and Satan trying to 
put an influence on the other two-thirds of the angels saying, look at me, I'm gorgeous. I need to be in command. But they were all cast out into this world. Now listen to this. The angels who stood in allegiance to Satan, this is what happens, took upon themselves his character, his unrighteousness, the dark side and the rebellious side. The Bible says either I am for Jesus or I am against Jesus Christ. Either I am working toward, walking toward, making an effort of having the character of Jesus, and if I don't, I have the character of Satan, whether I like it or not. There's only two classes in the world today. Listen to this. One ministry says, the devil, that old serpent, called Satan, intentionally and purposely set out to defy God's authority in heaven. Instead, now listen to this. Now you've got to think about this. Instead of aspiring the affection of all angels to love and honor the Creator, He diverted their attention to Him. We have the responsibility as we leave here today in our church. The information I've taken in, Ben, I am to share that with those out there in the world. I am to aspire. Be an inspirator, an inspiration of what God can do in a life, what He's done in my life. I'm to take this out to the world, not keep it to myself or bring attention to me. Look at me. And that's what the devil did. Now, here's what, here's what Jesus said. Bobby, listen to this. Then God shall say unto those who kneel before Satan and his evil angels, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. Now, we're going to clear this subject today about everlasting fire. If we say that those that are lost burn forever, we have stamped them with immortality. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. You know what that is? It's death forever and ever and ever and ever. And Peter talks about being consumed at the very end, the earth and the, everything in this solar system. But I want you to listen to this first. Let us clear up this subject today. Everlasting. It says right here that the angels, our enemies, will be cast into a hell's fire. And it says an everlasting fire. So we're going to clear that up today. In the New Testament, everlasting, the Greek word is enios. It is everlasting in the Greek gospel used here. It means, annual, it speaks of a time, a time that has limits. You hear what I just said? The word everlasting in the scripture, in annuals, means there is a time that this will end. This everlasting will end. Again, let me read one more time to you, Blake. Everlasting fire, or annuals, points to a duration of time. Lasting in its effect, but not forever. That's what they put that word in there for. We want to say, well, it's everlasting. That means they're burned and they burn and they burn. But it says here, annuals means a period of time. Now, let's, here's what it says in Jude 6, 7. Do we have that up there yet? Uh, Jude 6, 7. Uh, I may have pushed the button too fast on that, Linda. Yeah, thank you. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, were cast out of heaven, God hath reserved in everlasting change and darkness unto the judgment of that great day. Now listen carefully to this. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example. They're going to be an example, Sodom and Gomorrah, of this fire. Listen to this. Sodom and Gomorrah, an example, because of their fornication, they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. Let me ask you, is Sodom and Gomorrah on fire today? But it said eternal fire. The word there, again, we're going to go right back to Annios. It was in its effects. Sodom and Gomorrah will never come back. Gone. Burned up. Forever and ever and ever. It's lasting in its effect. But if you go over there today, fly over there, it's not on fire. But you said the Bible says it's an eternal fire. Listen to this. Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we're going to get to the point. 
burn for a time. Anios. They burned. An, how long did the fire burn in Sodom and Gomorrah, Crystal? Let me answer that for you. Sodom and Gomorrah burned for a time. They burned until all traces of sin and unrighteousness were gone. <laughs> Those that do not possess immortality. This earth and everything that's around this earth, we're going to talk about shortly, it burns up with a fervent heat. It is gone forever and ever and ever. No second chances. You hear what I just said. Now listen to this. Go to that location, those on the other side of the camera, and you will find the fire in Sodom and Gomorrah has been extinguished. Even though the scripture says that they will burn forever and ever in eternal fire, it's out. Now let's see it. All who rebel, I didn't say this, Bob, here's what the Bible says. All who rebel and reject God inclu are included in unrighteousness. And the unrighteous and the evil angels will be burned up and consumed forever and ever and ever. And we're going to find out why. We're going to find out why here shortly. We're still on the angels here, by the way. Listen to this. Here's what Peter 2, 4 says. 2 Peter 2, 4. Here's what the Bible says. Listen very carefully. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them to hell, and deliver them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto the judgment, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, making them an example unto those who should live ungodly after this. Now listen to this. Sodom and Gomorrah, Susan, were brought to ashes, consumed. The word everlasting, we'll go one more time, Anios refers to a fire designated for a period of time until all is consumed and one more time lasting in its effect. Now, we're going to find out why does God consume the unrighteous and the evil angels and Satan? Why? Why does he completely consume them? Now, listen to this. 2 Peter 3, 7 through 10. Here's what the Bible says. This is 2 Peter 3, 7 through 10. But the heavens and the earth which are now, that we're living in presently, which we see by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. But listen to this. But the day of the Lord will come in which the heavens, get this, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat Listen to this. The earth also and the works that are in, they shall be burned up. The heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. You know what that means? Completely consumed. Gone forever. Now listen to this. And the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Sodom and Gomorrah, the perfect example, will take place again. Eternal in its significance, eternal in its destruction, but gone forever. The earth, the unrighteous, and all the evil angels and Satan will be consumed by a cleansing fire. That's what fire does. It consumes and makes everything perfect again. Listen to this. All unrighteous, whether human or evil angel, shall be done away with. They will be exterminated. They will be annihilated. They will be consumed. They will be burned to ashes. How do you know they're going to be burned to ashes, Gary? Well, listen to this. If we'll turn to Malachi, the fourth chapter. When I visited with Lindy the other, the other day, I gave her about 176 scriptures, and I got 94 more added on. And so it's in Malachi, the fourth chapter. I don't know if she has that or not. Malachi, the fourth chapter, verse 1. And here's what the Bible says. Thank you. For behold, the day cometh. When is that? The second coming. Listen, that all shall burn as an oven, and the proud, yes, and all they that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up. But listen to this, saith the Lord of angels, the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. You farmers out there, I remember my grandpa Sanders working on the farm. He would go out there. 
He had all this property, and he would put dynamite under these trees. And he, he would blow the trees out, and they had these roots. He would dig down and then burn up the roots. Why? So it wouldn't come back again. You see where I'm going? So it wouldn't come back again. Listen to that. Those who have cleared lands of trees to make room for planting crops fully know to get rid of the trees forever. The roots must be completely dug up or burned till all roots have been consumed. If not, they will come back. So listen to this. This is what one writer said. I thought it was very interesting. God in the end of all things will burn up all traces of sin, all traces of unrighteousness, all traces of evil, all branches of sin, he will burn right down to the root of sin. The originator of sin and his accomplices will completely be eradicated forever. Not even the minutest chance of them ever raising their ugly heads again will ever happen. That's why you get rid of the roots. Once they're burned up and gone, there's no way they can come back up again. I can guarantee you this. When we enter the pearly gates, sin is gone forever and ever and ever. The originator of sin, the evil angels with him, and all those that said, I reject God, they're gone forever. It sounds brutal, but it has to be that way. Consumed forever and ever. You know, I don't, I have, we all have our own little uh, ideas or thoughts or impressions of what God is like I know the Bible makes it perfectly clear that he's a loving God and Jeremiah 31 3 says I'll love you forever and ever and ever he said that about the lost I'll love you forever and ever even if you don't enter the kingdom of heaven I can't believe that a God that loves us so much would allow those folks that were here for 20 years to burn forever and ever and ever and ever and go on like nothing's happening is anybody with me there's no closure that way you ever hear on on these news reports a family loses somebody and they don't know who took them away and they said until we find out what happened to our little loved one there's no closure once the <laughs> listen once the unrighteous and the evil angels and the devil are consumed forever there's closure it's over it's done with now let's go bit further to but today now let's get to the sermon now what do you say but today I wrote this down. I knew this was going to happen. We will spend our time together discussing our friends. Our friends who are invisible to the eye. Friends that stand behind this unseen curtain. A curtain that separates the spiritual from mankind. Realize it or not, right now there are angels in this room with us. Just because I don't see them doesn't make it true. Here they stand or sit right in amongst us. And the more we praise God, the bigger the smile they get. Come on. If you want to believe what the Bible says today, it's true. Now listen to this. Angels are real. They exist. They were created by the Creator, God the Father and His Son. Here's what it says in Job 38, 7. If you've got your Bibles out, let's turn to Job 38, 7. I don't know exactly when He created them. But I can tell you this. They've been here a long time. <laughs> We don't have all those answers. This is a, when the morning stars sang together, we're going to find out who they are. That's the angels. And all the denominations, praise the Lord, agree on that one. Thank you. And all the sons of God, we're going to find out today, the angels are referred to as the morning stars, and also they're referred to as the sons of God. And it says, they shouted for joy. They shouted for joy. That's what the Bible says in I'll read it one more time I'm out of my book here. When all the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And here's what the Bible says. Here's what the, those theologians have discovered, C.J. They said this. In Scripture, three times the angels said they shouted for joy. They shouted at creation for joy. They shouted at the plan of redemption as Jesus Christ walked out of that tomb. It said they shouted. And then... At the recreation of this earth. When the new Jerusalem comes down, it says that the angels, the emotional angels that are in love with us, that are our fellow servants, they start to shout. That's why I can shout with joy. It doesn't bother me. Throw me out. I'm shouting. 
I'm going to. I, I got to practice on my shouting. Because they've had much more practice at shouting than I have. Amen? <laughs> this is my favorite day. This is the chance that I can get up before the world and tell you how much I love Christ because of what He's done for me. I don't know what He's done for you, but I do know what He's done for me. Can somebody give me a minute on that? And that's what we're supposed to take to the world in our testimonies. And here's what it says in Isaiah 6, 3. Linda, I don't know if you have that or not. It's in Isaiah, the 6th chapter, verse 3. And here's what the Bible said. Listen to this. And one cried to another. Who is that? The angels? And they said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world, the whole earth, the whole universe is full of His glory. Whew. Man. You know, Carolyn, when you stood up today and raised your hands, I got chills. How come we're all so afraid to praise the Heavenly Father? It says, David, they sang, they danced, they carried on, they played music, they shouted, they cried. Is anybody with me? Praise the Lord. Let's go a bit further. Now listen to this. The angels continue to praise. And listen to this. In Isaiah 6, 3, the angels continue to praise and sing the holiness of their Creator. And above, now listen, above the throne of God, Isaiah saw this. I'm throwing this in there. He saw seraphims. What is that? Angels. And these angels had six wings. With twain the angel covered his face, he covered his feet, and then he stretched both wings to the air to glorify God. And here's what they said. One cried to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now listen to this. Here's what was going on in this scripture here. Now I'm going to tell you what's going on here. Listen to this. Isaiah, as he stood in the temple, he saw a vision. Man, I had prayed over and over. I'd love to see a vision. Have you? I probably have a heart attack, but I'd love to see one. I'd like to see a vision. And it said, and he saw two angels. And they, listen, they radiated with light to the point that they appeared to be on fire. They shined. Isaiah saw the angels with two wings covering the face. Why? In homage, or homage, homage, and reverence before God. Two wings covering the feet. Two wings covered the body, and two, listen to this, they were outstretched, singing and praising and crying, Holy, holy, holy is God in His perfection and in His holiness and in His character, and oh, what a mighty God we serve. That's what they were saying. We won't, when we sing, oh, what a mighty God we serve, I can't hear you all out there. We ought to be on top pitch. Oh, what a mighty God that we serve. Now listen to this. As we read this scripture, I wrote this down, Carolyn, I want to forget it. As I read that scripture that we just looked at in Isaiah 6 3, I just wanted to start crying out, Oh God, forgive me for my ignorance. These friends, these unseen beings, these who were created by you, and they're above me in my nature, they bow before you and they praise you. In their glory and your love to Christ. They see you as you truly are. I can't wait for that day to come. But it will come. It's going to happen. Listen to this. God, though I do not see you. Now, here's what's going through my head, Rosemary and Gary. Though I do not see you, someday I will. The Bible says face to face. And then at that time, I will fall upon my knees singing and praising God, holy, 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 how great thou truly are. We sing how great they are, but we don't know. We're only doing on the knowledge that we have. Wait till we see Christ and God the Father face to face. My face is going to be on the ground. <laughs> wow. They had the opportunity and have for trillions of years to worship the lovely Jesus. Now listen to this. A ministry called Bible Ask Me Ministry. I like that. The angels are unseen beings. They constantly minister to those who are heirs of salvation. Hebrews 1.14, I'm going to read that one more time. Hebrews 1.14, here's what the Bible says. Angels are sent to minister, to encourage, to strengthen, to uplift, to comfort those who have dedicated their lives 
in servitude. We are to be, Blake, we are to be servants to those who are in need. Did you know that? I have a fellow servant, an angel that's behind this curtain I don't see, but he's my fellow servant. Whatever I need, he's going to do all that he can to be a servant. We, on the other hand, need to do the same for those in need. And if you look around, folks, there's folks in need out there. They are in desperate need. Listen to this. They love those who worship God, our friends on the other side of the country. They love those that obey God. They love those that are worshiping the blood of Christ. And these are those, now listen, whom God sends His holy angels. The holy angels come to us, the redeemed, in time of need. Did you know that? They actually come to minister. Now listen to this. They are called, as we'll say one more time, unseen beings. They're called the sons of God, the morning star, and also they're called the host. If you're turning Genesis 19, 1, it seems like the angels come to us in our most desperate hour. And if you'll turn to, uh, that's in Genesis 19, 1. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. And it says, and there came two angels to Sodom at, in the evening, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them, he, these angels, he rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. I think he knew they were angels. I think there was no question in his mind about it. It said, and he bowed his face to the ground. And here's what he said. And Lot said, behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into my house. And I want you to tarry with us all night. I want you to wash your feet. Now, here's what the point. Sometimes they come in human form. They were washing their feet. I believe in my lifetime there has been angels come in human form when I desperately needed them. And that's exactly what was going on here. And it said, and in the morning he said, get out of town, for you are within the darkest place of unrighteousness on this planet. And he said, I bid you get out of town. Now listen to this. Verse 15. I don't know if I even have that in there. Verse 15. And when the morning arose, the angels, the friends of Lot, his fellow servants, sent from God, they arise, and listen, and they said, Lot, take your wife and your two daughters and get out of this city. They were there to warn him. Not only to comfort him, but to warn him. Now, let's go a bit further with this now. I think of the angel that God sent to Joseph. Listen to this. Now, if you'll turn your Bibles, I think you'll find that in Matthew, the first chapter. In fact, I didn't even give her quite a scripture on this, Lynn. I'm sorry. In Matthew, the first chapter, let me just read to you what was going on here. We're talking about Joseph here. Listen to this. Joseph, the writer says, was in deep thought. Maybe a little perplexed as to what to do as he finds out his beloved Mary is with child and he knows he didn't do it. I mean, come on, are you with me? And he's perplexed as to what to do. Because you know, at that time in Joseph's time, if a girl became pregnant before being wed, they were really looked down upon. In today's society, 45% of the children born today aren't married at all. And no one gives it a second thought. Is anybody with me? You think the world ain't upside down? So there's Joseph. He's perplexed. He finds out that his beloved marries with child. And at that time in history, to be unwed and pregnant was the most grievous and shameful, shameful act of sin. It was really looked down upon. And the estate commentary, which I love to read, here's what it said. Joseph may have had questioned whether it would be morally right for him to marry someone who had appeared was an adulteress. Now, this had to be going through his mind. Think about it. He knew he hadn't been with her. However, listen to this, how God, good God is. An angel appeared in a dream while he was brooding over the problem that had perplexed him. Here's what the angel said. Joseph, fear not. <laughs> the woman that you love the woman you're going to marry is a virtuous woman. Can somebody get me on this? She is untouched by any man. But through the Holy Spirit, she will conceive, and you shall name him Jesus. Now, I want you to think about this. Joseph sitting in his room at night, maybe just a candle, sitting in the dark. His, the love of his life is with child, and he knows he didn't do it, and he doesn't know what to do. Listen to this. I believe this, that a weight and a burden, a perplexing situation 
would listen was lifted from Joseph's heavy heart through communication with a friend, an angel. Is anybody with me? Angels have personalities. They have intellect. They have emotions. They are identified in Scripture as being wise. And in 2 Samuel, thank you for that. It says, then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel. Now, here's what I like about Joseph. When he found out the truth, he went straight and took care of the problem. Can somebody give me an amen? I think he went and maybe com comforted Mary. Hey, I know what's going on now. I'm sorry I had any, any doubts about you. Can you say that, amen, for that? How many husbands, how many of you have apologized to your wife when you knew that you were wrong? Oh, see, no hands went up. But anyway, <laughs> he humbled himself before it. Now listen to this. I believe that a burden was lifted. Now listen to this. We found out in 2 Samuel 14, 20. If you want to turn your Bible, I don't think Linda, I even got these two. I'm sorry if I, if I didn't. 2 Samuel 14, 20. Maybe I even wrote down the own scripture, but here's, here's what the Bible says. When talking about the angels, this is this. And my Lord is wise. He's talking about an angel here. The wisdom of an angel of God. So we're going to find out today that that angel that loves you has emotions. They truly love us. They truly want to protect us. I'll say this. When Jesus was on the cross, I would say the whole host of heaven said, Oh God, let me go. The whole host, please let me go and take care of this. Now listen to this. Angels, we're going to find out here shortly, they have a will. A will to praise God, a will to serve, and a will, listen, a will to obey the Heavenly Father. And listen to this. God sent an angel to John on the Isle of Patmos. And this angel directed John in his writings of Revelation. The angel spoke of prophecy. The angel spoke of the church. The angel spoke of Christ. And the angel warned John of the end of time. And listen to what Jesus said. John, I have sent mine angel to testify unto you the things in the church. I am using my angel to communicate between you and I. Now we find out that angels are communicators. They are a real being. Listen to this. Angels possess the power to greet. They recognize they possess memory. They have knowledge regarding life on this earth, the plan of salvation. They Listen, they are servants of God. They are called a host. They are eternal beings. And one writer says they are deathless. Any angel that has stood up for right like they did in heaven when all the rest were cast out, they are deathless. They will never taste death. Can somebody give me an amen on that? Our friends, listen to this. Here's what Jesus said in Luke 20. I didn't even write the scripture down, Linda. I'm sorry. In Luke 20, here's what it said. Here's what Jesus said. Those that resurrect from the dead, the redeemed, as we enter heaven, we will not marry. There will be no marriage ceremonies in heaven. Neither can they die anymore. For they, the angels and God's redeemed, they are equal as the heavenly angels. We are the children of God Death will not be present nor allowed in heaven. Wow. So the angels that stood up for Jesus Christ will live forever and ever. Now listen to this. We're going to close here in just a minute, Blake. I'm sorry I'm taking up so much time. It says the angels are soldiers in chariots of fire. They are an army and they're on our side. Now before I read this next text to you, let me explain to you what was going on here. The Bible describes how God, prov listen, provided an army of angels to protect Elisha and the city of Dotham, the city in which God has sent his prophet Elijah. Now, here's what was going on before I read the scripture to you, Ben. Syria was at war with Israel. It seems like Syria was always at war with Israel. The king of Syria was disturbed that Elisha, the prophet, was able to predict where the king's army next planning attack would be. Elisha knew, and this king didn't like it. So in 2 Kings, here's what happened. Therefore, listen, he sent thither horses and chariots and a great host of men, and they came by night, and they surrounded the city of Dotham, where Elisha dwelt. The king of Syria sent a host of army of chariots 
of soldiers, of spears, and all that, and surrounded this city. And when, the next morning, when the servant of the man of God, Elisha had a servant, he rose early and he stepped out of the city, and behold, he saw a host compassing this city. And he looked at Elijah and said, We are in trouble. What are we going to do? We are surrounded by an army of soldiers, and they look like they're evil. Listen to this. And Elisha looked at his servant, and he said, Calm down. Fear not, for the curtain has been drawn back from the seen and the unseen, and I see there are more angels on our side than they have soldiers on their side. <laughs> Think about that. And the servant is going, what are you looking at? And so Elisha said, God, would you give my servant the, the, the spiritual eyes and remove that curtain? And then the servant saw all of a multitude of angels, and they were fire setting on horses, and the chariots were on fire. And he said, we win. Come on. <laughs> so he, God didn't want Elisha to even have one moment of discomfort and he gave him he drew back the curtain and they saw hundreds of thousands of angels on horses now listen to this I put this down God could have sent one angel <laughs> one and destroyed the whole army of Syria but here's what I think he wanted to do Susie, he wanted us and Elisha to get just a glimpse of his power. If deemed necessary, God says, I would, I want you to just think about this for a second. Now, this is what was going through my head. Listen to this. He may have said, I, if God deemed it necessary, he said, I would surround the earth with angels hand in hand with enough power to shake the foundations of the universe if I want to. Come on. He could have done that. Listen to this in Matthew 26, 51, 52, and 53. It's in Matthew 26, 51, 52, and 53. Here's what the Bible says. And behold, one of the disciples, his name was Peter, was in the garden. And here's what he did. When he saw that Jesus was in trouble, he thought Jesus needs a friend. He drew out his sword and he cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. You remember that? Here's what Jesus said. Put up your sword into its place. For all that take the sword will, listen, perish by the sword. And here's what he said to Peter. And I like this. Peter Thinketh thou not that I cannot pray to my Father, and he shall present, listen, presently send me in the twinkling of an eye 72,000 angels? <laughs> That's what he could have done. The garden would have been full then, wouldn't it? He could have sent 72,000. At all Jesus said, God send the angels. He could have had 72,000. Now listen to this. Let's go to Matthew 25, 31. I know I'm throwing out a lot of scriptures today, but we're talking about angels. As we read the words of Jesus, as he describes his second coming. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. And listen to this. All the holy angels with him. Then will he sit upon his throne. You know what he's saying there? When I come to get my church, I am going to empty out heaven. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, let's go to Revelation 8.1. I don't know if you can get there that fast or not. In Revelation 8, 1, let's go there. And this will, this, this will reinforce what Jesus said. When I come at the second coming, all of my holy angels in heaven, I'm going to bring with me. He didn't say five, 72,000. He said five. And 8, 1. And here's what the Bible says. Thank you. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven. About the space of a half hour. Now, as you go into prophecy, you have two outtakes on this here. Two different theories on what this means, that there'll be silence in heaven for a half hour. Now, biblically, 
It means a half hour in our time is one week. It's quiet in heaven for a solid week. So you've got two explanations here. Here's the one that I like. Here's the one I'm leaning toward. This silence in heaven, following the terrible events that take place on earth, immediately preceding the second coming, is caused by all the heavenly hosts and the angels. They leave the celestial courts and they accompany Jesus to earth to claim His church. That's what I feel, because that's what Jesus said. Now, the other take on this, another theologian said, that for one week before the second coming, no one says anything in heaven. I think heaven's a busy place. <laughs> it's busy. I, I think this. In 12th chapter of Daniel, it says that God looks at Jesus and that great prince that died for his people, he stands up. And when he stands up, he's saying, we're going home. And I believe it's that time that all the angels are looking at Jesus, waiting for him to say, let's go. I believe whatever that last week is, I believe they're shouting. There's all kinds of activity going in heaven because they cannot wait to take the trip to get the fellow servants that they love, these angels. Come on. And I believe the silence is there's no one there. In our daycare, the only time I get silence is when all the kids are gone. <laughs> there is no silence. You can say to those 12 kids, if you don't quiet down, you don't get a snack, and they look at you and they just go on. So the only time it could be quiet in heaven, that space of a half hour, which is a week in our time, is when everyone has left. And I believe that Jesus is a God of authority and that he puts everything in its place at a certain time. I believe it's quiet there. I think they're on the way to this earth to get their church. And it's going to take them a week to get here in their own time. And on the way here, don't tell me there's not going to be some shouting going on. And praising God. And the radiance of God will put out all the stars as we talked about a few weeks ago. He's so bright in His holiness that all the stars will go out as He comes toward earth. All will go black and all we're going to see is the radiance of a Holy Father with all the hosts of heaven. Can somebody give me an amen on that? Those are the ones that's behind that curtain and they are our friends. They are on our side. Isn't it good to have somebody on your side? You know, when, da uh, when David went to fight the giant, you mentioned it today, all he had was a little flat rock, and this giant, 7 to 10 feet tall, weighed four, five, or 600 pounds. His spear weighed two or 300 pounds. He was there waiting with this big old helmet, and he had one, evidently, a little slot in the middle helmet, and that's where it hit. I believe that maybe an angel took the rock in its flight and put it there. Can somebody give me on that? I mean, I'm just throwing this out there. Because I know they're on my side, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for this service today. We thank you for the presence that we felt of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that there are angels taking up residence in this building. And I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for the music, our Bible class. I thank you for all that participated. Even those that came today, they are in participation as to what goes on here. We need our church family, every last one of them. I pray that they were enlightened today and encouraged and given some hope today. I thank you for this message that even in the loneliness of times when I'm having those pity parties, there's angels surrounding old Donnie trying to comfort him, say it's going to be okay. Jesus is on his way. Thank you, Father, for this message and for your love. Thank you, Father, for the privilege and the opportunity to preach the love of Jesus to your people. In the name of the Heavenly Father, the Father of the living Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.